And we are live. Welcome to episode 17 of Mount Old Sports Complex. Talk sports to me. I'm your host, the sports guru. Tonight, we will continue with our five-part series, Sneaker Gods, Sports, and Sneakers. Still vibing the Piccolo Pete, emotional wreckage all week. If you don't have it, get on Apple, Mu Apple Music, download it. Piccolo Pete, emotional wreckage. One of the hottest albums out for a young rapper right now, so... This is 606 Maintain, representing his hometown. Part three is titled Running Revenue. And tonight we will discuss how the shoe brand marketing is con constantly increasing. Uh, part one, we discussed the coming of the shoe market. And we talked about how shoe companies starting dating back into the 1920s with uh, Converse and Chuck Taylor All-Star. Um, made a push to buy the athlete. And in 1984, the biggest shoe contract ever signed was by the one and the only Michael Jordan. We all know that. What a lot of people don't know, and we're going to talk about it later on in the week, is that the original Jordan, um, the original Jordan never made it off the shelves. So the original Jordan tennis shoe was a shoe that was created by Nike to show Jordan at the time Jordan was making a strong, Adidas was making a strong push to sign Michael Jordan. So just think about how that would change the shoe game as we know it, if Michael Jordan would have signed with Adidas. In part two, we discussed endorsement deals and sponsorships. And we talked about how in 1984, uh, Michael Jordan was the one and only professional athlete in the NBA with a shoe deal. And 1974, uh, Oregon Duck, Steve Prefontaine, signed a lucrative $5,000 deal with Nike for their running shoe, the Steve, Pre Steve Prefontaine. Tonight, in Episode 3, we will get an inside look at how marketing has grown with shoe companies. I got a special guest tonight, uh, and he will be joining us in just a little bit. And it is someone that, if you're from the, the Kentucky area, Central Kentucky area, You've heard the name, you know him, you've probably seen him play in a gym near you. It's going to be a pleasant surprise tonight. So tune in and stay with us so you can see that. This episode is brought to you by Mount Orb Sports Complex and Anchor.fm. Please follow us on Facebook at Mount Orb Sports Complex, um, Instagram at Talk Sports TM. That's T A L K S P O R T S T M. At Twitter, talk sports to me one, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel at Mount Orr Sports Complex. Talk sports to me. This podcast can also be heard on Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. Like I mentioned last night, we have grown, we have evolved from episode one to episode seventeen. We have made drastic improvements, and we are now being aired in other places. Um. As mentioned before, our guest tonight will be a very special guest. Um, so right now I want to dive right into the topic for tonight. And the five-part series is um, Sneaker God, Sports and Sneakers, How Kicks Control the Game. And this week we've talked about on Monday and Tuesday how you know some, everyone knows someone who has a closet full of shoes. And all those shoes are shoes that probably have someone else's name on them. And those shoes, whether they are Jordans, Kyrie's, uh, Durant's, uh, D Rose's, whatever the situation might be, endorsement deals run sports right now as we know it. And guys are making more money off their endorsement deals than they are making off their actual contracts. Um, episode three or part three of the five part series is, um, running revenue. And so we're going to dive into how the branding of the shoe companies has always evolved and continued to grow because of what we as the consumer do, which is spend our money on the merchandise. And these companies have far, far exceeded just shoes. They now sell sweatsuits. They now sell T-shirts. They sell hoodies. 
Um, you can buy just about anything that you need. Golf clubs, Nike. You can buy Nike golf clubs. You can buy Adidas golf clubs. You can buy about any major brand, anything that you need. They can sell it to you. They produce it. They manufacture it. And that is how that's, this is how it has it, how this has evolved. In 1972, Nike's average revenue, and, and, and keep in mind, this is the same year that they dropped the um, Bruin shoe, the, Bru the Bruin and Blazer shoe. So the UCLA shoe, 1972 is when that shoe dropped. That year, their revenue was $2 million. In 1972, Nike made a whopping $2 million. Now, for a shoe company at that time, that was probably – more money than God. But since then, from 1972 to 2020, Nike's net per year is $31.9 billion. So they've went from $2 million to $31.9 billion. And this is all basically based on branding and it's all basically based on name um anything that anywhere you go if you go to a basketball camp the t-shirt that they're probably going to give you has a nike swoosh on it and as i say that i'm looking through the through the looking on the facetime the face the facebook live and i'm seeing that this shirt i have on now says camp one basketball and there's a nike swoosh on the top of it somebody paid for these these shoe companies are making money hand over fist, basically off a symbol and a name. Because I'm sure that if you or I really put our heads to it and got the right people around us, we could probably produce a shoe that was the same quality as Nike that didn't have the swoosh on it that we would have to sell for much, much less money than what they sell their shoes for. When D. Rose signed his Adidas contract, everyone said it was a curse because for the two seasons following D. Rose's lucrative Adidas deal, D. Rose got hurt, back-to-back -back seasons. And he was making a lot of money through Adidas at that time. And everyone said, could this possibly be the Adidas curse. Everyone, everyone who's a sports fan remembers that. And so the next thing that happens, fast forward seven, eight, nine years, the next great thing in college basketball, who is going to get a lucrative, ginormous shoe contract is Zion Williams. And we talked about him last night and how he's making 15, per, 15 million per year through Nike. And he's not even, he's played, you know, minimum 25, 30 games through the NBA season, 40 games, whatever, through the NBA season. Okay. So, but if you remember, he blew out a Nike. His one and only freshman year at Duke, he blew out a Nike. And so this shoe thing has evolved. It, it's not about the quality of the shoe. It's all the name and it's all branding. Okay. When Steve Prefontaine took that crop, that lucrative deal that was worth $5,000 in 1974, Nike knew they were onto something by putting the name with the name. They knew they were onto something by putting the name with the name. So the title is running revenue of, part three of our five part series and it's running revenue pun intended because it all started with Nike all started within with endorsements and sponsorships with a runner wasn't a basketball player wasn't a football player it was the most popular runner in the country in the 1920s Adidas reinvented itself and and came with a different form of shoe but they were smart enough to understand that they had to 
attack a different audience. So they didn't go after who the other shoe manufacturer at that time, which was Chuck Taylor, went after. They went after soccer players. And so in 1940, Adidas attempted to make a clean sweep and just take everybody that was trying to manufacture and in the thought process of producing shoes out of the game. And they just basically approach the soccer and the track athlete. Adidas has really conquered the world with longevity because they were first manufactured and produced in 1920. And they've held steady. And though they don't make the same amount of money as Nike makes, they're still making $7 billion per year. And no one has taken their brand. And I say that to say this, Converse is no longer a brand of its own. Converse is a brand of Nike. And so I'll touch on that in just a few minutes. Um, but the Chuck Taylor All-Star is, before mentioned, one of the popular, most popular shoes on the West Coast. And so, you know, through, a D, through Converse, understanding that just selling the Chuck regionally wasn't going to be enough to keep them in the business. Nike came and said, Hey, I got a proposition for you. You keep the Chuck Taylor all-star, you get a percentage of the revenue that we generate. We manufacture and produce your product and we corner the market and we do things how we want to do with your shoe. Adidas wasn't having it. And so, you know, right now I want to go, I want to switch gears a second and I want to jump right in to the top 15 shoe brands in the United States of America as far as athletic footwear. And some of these name brands of shoes I've never heard of before. And it's not me being high sedity or it's not me being uppity or anything like that because I wasn't raised that way. But what I'm saying is that some of these manufacturers don't even try to exist in an American market because they understand what they're up against. And so their targets are different places. They're American manufacturers, they're German manufacturers, but they're manufacturing and selling product other places because here it's just not as popular. So number one, everybody would figure it out, Nike at $31.9 billion annually. Number two, Adidas, whose gross sales went up over 30% in the last year. So they're still, they're still running uphill, okay? Running revenue. Stay with me. They're still running uphill. Adidas, or Under Armour, which is a relatively, relatively young copy of a, of a shoe brand that's founded in 1996. So they've only been around for the essence of 23 years or so. And um, they've kind of found their niche through football. And then, you know, who, the, the, all the, who we built this house commercial and protect your house commercial. That was kind of Under Armour's niche. And they found their niche. And then when they found their niche, they found their athlete being Steph Curry. Um, they have expanded financially uh, through signing Steph Curry. Their numbers have went up immensely. Number four is Skecher. And I, I, I presume that that would be because it's a walking shoe is what I would presume. Number five is New Balance. Uh, interesting tidbit, New Balance produces more shoes annually than any other manufacturer. They produce over 4 million pairs of shoe a year. So even though it's not, the more they, the, the more they make, they lower the price, the more they sell. And so New Balance has some, some hot shoes, the 990s, uh, the 880s, whatever they were. I had a couple pair. I've had some New Balance. They're a pretty decent shoe. Asics, a great running shoe. They target the cross-country and track community. Sacconi, Sacconi is one of the oldest manufacturers running. They're, they started making shoes back in the 1890s. So Sacconi is, is still functioning at number seven. Number eight 
is a Via, another running shoe. Number nine, if you were born in the 80s and raised in the late 80s and early 90s, Brent Dudley, I know you had a pair, British Knights. British Knights. British Knights is still relevant. Um, it's an urban shoe now, and it's worn usually by the teenage crowd. Uh, the average age of people that wear the British Knight is 15 to 25, worn heavily in other countries, worn heavily on the East Coast. A lot of people in the music industry are wearing the British Knights. Number 10, Reebok. Re uh, sorry, number 10, Brooks, which was founded in 1914 in Seattle, another brand I wasn't familiar with. In 2001, Brooks decided to make a strategic move to only focus on creating and manufacturing running shoes. So they only make running shoes. Again, running revenue. Brooks is a manufacturer of a shoe that we probably never heard of. And they are in the they are number 10 in the top 15 of shoe sales every year annually based on the target audience. Now, Reebok didn't even make the top 15. Reebok didn't even make the top 15. Number 11 is Amerisports. Number 12 is Infinity, which is an athlete, well, shoe uh, primarily worn by female athletes. Don't know what type of athlete. Couldn't find a lot of research on it. Number 13 is the Newton running shoe. Number 14 is Columbia Sportswear, an Oregon-based outfit. Sure, they work in contingency with some with Nike on some things, maybe something being in Oregon because Nike controls that region. Um, they focus on outdoor sporting materials. Uh, number 15, Eddie Bauer, which is more of an accessory-based company. So Reebok did not make this list. And my best guess would be that Reebok didn't make this list because out of the list of top 15, if you notice what I said, and I'll go back through again, but we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of the top 15 are all shoes that are primarily worn that are primarily manufactured and worn by runners. And runners pay top dollar for a good shoe. So now that we've looked inside the history behind shoe companies and looked at some of the outside brands, such as Brooks, um, such as Infinity, some brands that we probably didn't know of, um, some of their cases have longevity. Some of these companies have been around since the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. They have longevity because they have a target audience. The profile brands such as Nike and Adidas have moved forward to the higher profile athlete. But the higher profile athlete is who sells merchandise. So Next up, we're going to hear from an athlete who has played through many shoe brand turnovers and played with many players with sponsorship and endorsement deals and apparel deals. Um, and really what I want to talk to our guest about tonight is how much of an impact that had on him and how much of an impact that had on the game. Um, this episode is brought to you by Mount Orb Sports Complex and Anchor.fm. Um, we are we are ready to move forward with our guest tonight. Um, please check us out at Instagram, Spotify, um, wherever else that you can find us. We're on Google Podcast. Uh, we're on Facebook. So we're a little bit of everywhere. Um. Tonight's guest is a man that if you're from Central Kentucky, like I mentioned earlier, you he's a household name. He was a great player um, during his time uh, in the early to mid-90s. He had an illustrious career uh, in college, and he will give us some insight tonight 
on how everything has worked with him in terms of shoe companies and shoe deals and, and that type of thing. So we're having some technical difficulties now trying to get through. Okay, here we go. And so we've got our guest and we are live. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction. Please help me welcome tonight's guest from Paris, Kentucky, now living in Davenport, Iowa, Paris High School, 10th Region and State of Kentucky Hall of Famer, University of uh, Louisville legend, former Phoenix Sun, and long longtime European uh, EuroLeague All-Star, Alvin Sims. What's up, Al? How you doing, man? I'm good, Glad man. You're on the show. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, so I just want to go through a couple things first before we get into our conversation um, to give our listeners, uh, most of our listeners, I'm sure, know you, but for the ones who don't, I want to give them a brief rundown of you and your career. Uh, you played at uh, Paris High School on some very good teams at Paris in the early 90s, uh, played at Louisville uh, from 1993 to 1997, Scored over a thousand points in a Cardinal uniform, was a team captain, had a great career, and you are much beloved by many, many, many Louisville fans. You were fortunate to have uh, a stint in the NBA with the Phoenix Suns. You had an illustrious overseas career spanning over 15 seasons and uh, got some to do something that a lot of people didn't get to do, and that was play for a legendary coach and Denny Crump. And when you're a sports guy and a basketball guy like me and you talk about Denny Crump, he's up there with the likes of John Wooden, Dean Smith, John Thompson, Jim Beheim, the guys with eight or 900 wins. Um, the thing that I have grown to appreciate and like about you the most now, Al, is you're giving back to the community and um, the kids that you work with, with work with in wherever you're stationed at um, during your 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 uh, seasons in life, um, we're going to touch on the fact that all your kids are hooper, hoopers, all of them, and you're able to somehow be able to be there for the, for all of them, you know, as best as you can, traveling a lot to work with them and help them improve their game, and so I think that's awesome as well. So tonight we're going to talk to you, and we're going to. Uh, Talk about some sneakers, man, and how uh, sneakers impacted uh, basketball as as we know it. This op uh, episode is brought to you by Mount Orb Sports Complex and Anchor.fm. So let's dive into it, Al. What are you doing right now? Like in your life, what are you doing right now? You talking about pre-corona? Or... Yeah, pre-corona, pre-corona. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I work at a, at a – um intermediate school um, and I also coach there I coach uh, seventh grade boys basketball there um, I also have uh, I train uh, I have the training uh, business s5 Academy mm -hmm. uh, you can look it up on the s5 Academy Facebook page okay. uh, I do a lot of trainings here I also coach uh, travel ball the Iowa swarm uh just now getting started uh this year pretty much so but as you know the setbacks since we have the pandemic right right um you know and and i'll i'll go a little more in depth about your high school career a little later on in the in the show but you know as a as a a, a young man in high school i hear a lot about you know your athleticism and how strong you were, you know, even as a high school kid, how big and athletic you were, but how skilled you were. And coming from a town like Paris, and Paris is not, it's bigger than my hometown of Ripley, but it's not the biggest place in the world. You know, it, it's the town that you go through on 68 to get to Lexington. And that's how a lot of people, that's my whole life. That's what I knew about Paris, that you were from there. And that's the town I had to go through to get to, to Lexington. So coming from Paris and Paris not being Paul Lawrence Dunbar, where G George Baker played, who we talked to last night, and, um, you know, some of the bigger schools in the city of Lexington. How was your recruiting process? 
I so we're going to uh, recruiting. Recruiting. Uh, I mean, playing against the Lexington schools was, was a benefit for me because that's how I got a lot of exposure. Um, you just mentioned uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, uh, a, a player that was before uh, the guy you just mentioned, Darnell Burton. Yeah, was was the was the man at that time, and we were you know with the same class. So uh, if if you remember Alan Cutler, yeah, he did a special every year when we played Dunbar, it wasn't again, it wasn't Paris against Dunbar, it was Burton versus Sims. Right. So uh, we were like the top, the top sophomores, juniors at that time, uh, and that that game became a rivalry between me and him, and that got me a lot of exposure. And we also played uh, travel ball together. It was all star travel ball. It wasn't AAU yet. Yeah, right. Um, so we we ventured out to Vegas and LA, and I got a lot of like got a lot of looks there. Um, and we both did. Uh, you know, Cincinnati looked at both of us, and uh, I had a different different style of play than him. Uh, we were both athletic. Both jumped high. Um, but you know, I had more attributes like ball handling and all that stuff. Right. So, yeah, you were very um, skilled for how athletic you were. Yeah. So, um, the recruiting process started then, um, going into my junior year, which we ventured out to the the West Coast. Uh, we, we played against a lot of competition. Jason Kidd was, uh, I think he was ranked number one at the time. Roger Rose was ranked number two at that time. Um, there was a lot of people up and coming. The O'Bannon brothers were, no, were well known out there. Uh, modern day didn't have a uh, all star team. They had they had the the actual high school team playing against uh, all star. <laughs> so yeah, that's how good they were. Wow. Um, so Las Vegas had a nice team out there. It was I mean it was you know it was an amazing atmosphere. A lot of coaches were out there. Yeah, I went out to. Uh, I was fortunate to go out to Vegas twice to the. Uh, Adidas event, the big show or big time. It was an yeah. Adidas event in the late nineties. And I was able to go out there twice. And that was a, 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 a eye awakening, you know, a, a, a eye opening experience, I guess I should say for me, because I had only been in my bubble and I was good in my bubble, but I had played players that were outside my bubble. Like for instance, Jerron Brown, he was outside my bubble per se, but I had played him, but, we were, I was able to compete still, but when I went to Vegas the first time, it opened my eyes to like what had to happen when I came back home. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. it was, it, there was so many good players. So just piggybacking off of, and the reason I asked you about your recruiting process was because I'm going to piggyback off that. And I knew you would have some, you know, some stories about, you know, traveling to play and some, some, some all star travel teams and that type of thing. Were shoe companies like involved at the time, and like what 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 was that situation in the you know in the early nineties in terms of shoe companies? You know, just six years after Mike had signed that initial initial Nike deal. Okay, so um, Vegas was the Nike invitation. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to L.A. It was it was Pepsi. It wasn't this, it wasn't uh, it didn't have any affiliation with shoe. It was just Pepsi. Pepsi uh, sponsored the whole event, but uh, yeah, uh, corporations they they had a big uh, they had a big impact on uh, you know amateur sports. So uh, people needed sponsors. Uh, corporations stepped up. Uh, Nike Nike and Adidas pretty much took over uh, during that time. You know you had the the Nike camp, you had the Adidas camp. Uh, you know, you had the five star, which most of the time everybody wore Nike. Yeah, that was a Howard Garfunkel. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so did did you know what was your kick in high school? Like, do you remember what 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 was your kick in high school? Like, what was it that you wore in high school that was like your shoe, or did it, it did it did it not really matter? Because I know I coach high school basketball, and the first question. You know, I'm the head coach at Felicity, and the first question that every year as we start to approach conditioning is halfway through conditioning and 
kids are wanting to know what kind of shoes we get. <laughs> and we've been with Adidas the last the last few years, and uh, the kids are wanting to switch over to Nike, but it's important to them. Was it important to you? Uh, it was very important. Um, Nike was the most popular, but uh, I think and I think on my freshman year we wore Converse at Paris. Uh, I, you know, I didn't really, I didn't like them, but I think I actually got got my own pair uh, of Nike and wore those mm -hmm. probably midway through the season. And then, like, uh, you know, the upperclassmen the next year demanded Nike, and you know, everybody wanted to wear that. So the coach was like, okay, we're gonna vote on it. Everybody wanted Nike. When you um, when you were junior senior year in high school, had colleges started to had shoe companies started to really do the sponsorship thing with colleges yet? Because I, I was a I remember in, in '96 I'm a Syracuse fan, and um, I remember in '96 was like one of the first years that Syracuse had the Nike uniform. So was 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 when you were in high school. Were colleges at that time starting to get the the, the contracts with the shoe companies? Um, it, you had to be top twenty five, and you had to be on TV. Okay. Um, like when I before I went to Louisville, they they had a Converse uh, deal with Converse, and but they wore a champion uniform. Gotcha. So it, it it started it did start at that time, but you had to be top twenty five and on TV. Probably, I would say probably top ten in the nation to get you know actual shoe deal. Right, a lucrative deal, like a good deal. So right. you played, um, and I mentioned it during your introduction, but you played for legendary Crum, uh, coach Denny Crum, who is Hall of Fame. Um, Great basketball coach. Um, I knew, you know, Coach Crum was a disciplinary, and you could see that on TV when you watch the games. But how was that experience, you know, for you, like being able to play for what what is arguably one of the top ten greatest college coaches of all time? Uh, in the beginning, I, I have to admit, it, it was very difficult for me in the beginning because – you know, coming from a small town and being being that guy, especially all around the state, um, I wasn't really coached. I just played. I played off my athleticism. I, I played off instinct. And, you know, I just – if if I needed to score or if I knew I had to take over a game, I would do it. And then when you go to – and I go to Louisville, and like you said, uh, I bump into Denny. Uh, there's there's rules and regulations, so uh, it took me it took me a while to you know to figure out what where I fit in, and uh, I had to learn a lot. And once I once it took me to you know my junior year actually to know my role and, and what I need to be where I need to be as far as uh, to contribute to to the team and be be successful. That's um that says a lot for your for your mental toughness because kids nowadays, a lot of kids get away from home and when they run in, there, there are some coaches out there still like coach Crum. Like there still are some coaches that are in their sixties and seventies that are from the old school that are, are very strict and that lay down the law. And that if you leave, they'll find someone to replace you. And a lot of kids, choose to be the kid that leaves to be replaced. And so for you to stay there, that says a lot about you. Did you, um, did you guys end up with a, with a uniform shoe deal at any time during your four years at, at Louisville? Yeah. So my sophomore year, um, uh, Converse, we, we signed, you know, we were Converse, Nike approached, approached us. Um, uh, <laughs> they offered everything and, Coach Crone was just loyal to Converse. So pretty much Converse took over everything. So they, they, they gave us our gear, the shoes, you know, luggage. Everything was Converse. Um, I even, like like I said, if you if you were top 25 and on TV all, all the time, I even, um, 
played in promos. Uh, you, you remember uh, Grandma Ma? Yeah. Uh, Larry Johnson. Larry Johnson, yeah. You know, I, I used to uh, try out his shoes before they came out. They used to put them on me when we played a national TV game or something. They give me his shoes, try these out, and I would wear them during the game. And so that's how that, and that's how that all started. I mean, that's what that's what the sponsorship deal started as putting shoes on guys' feet and hoping that people on TV saw it and wanted to buy it. I'll tell you a funny story. When I was a when I was um, when I was a freshman, we had team shoes, and they were Nikes. And then the company, which you're familiar with, because it's in Campbellsville, Kentucky. H and W Sports, Ronnie and Rick Horde. Uh-huh. They were they went. We got a a, a a a deal like my high school got a deal with them where they were ordering everything that they needed for our sports program at twenty percent of cost or whatever, as long as they ordered everything that we needed. So like we had to uter- order uniforms and and. Uh, books and clipboards and dry erase boards and whatever you could think of we ordered and back then they took care of the coaches by like giving coaches like carry bags like briefcases and giving us all like you know back then nobody carried book bags like they do now you carried you carried a gym bag you know it was a gym bag with handles and so we got all that stuff and my senior year we had converse and my sophomore and junior year, I wasn't brave enough to do it, but I didn't like the Converse. And at the time, my mom would always make me order my shoes like a half size too big because I was growing and she'd say I needed to grow into them. So there was one year that I, I had Converse that were like 12s and I needed 11s or they were 13 and I needed 12s. And so I was putting like stuff in the toe of the shoe to stuff it so it wouldn't be so loose on my foot so I could move like I wanted to. So my senior year, I was finally brave enough and knew that um, that if I if I didn't have that shoe, that I could probably weasel my way into coming up with something else. And what I did was I cut the Converse. I didn't like it, and so I cut it and told my coach that it busted out. Coach Jutsy, if you're watching, please don't get mad at me. But I, 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 I cut the side of the shoe, and um, I just kept – when I was jab stepping and anything that I was doing in practice, I would exaggerate it. So my shoe would bust out the side. So my foot would bust out the side of that shoe and it happened. And um, I was like, coach, I got another pair of shoes at home. They're blue and white and everything. Like, you don't, there's really no need to hire me, you know, to call and order another pair. Cause it'll take a couple weeks. Like I'll just wear the ones I got and they were Nikes. And so everybody else had Chuck Taylor all-stars, but I had Nikes. <laughs> and so that was like either my junior or senior year. So ne- next thing, uh, 1993, um, 94, you guys, Louisville was 28 and six and 10 and two in the conference and won the Metro, which was a tough conference. 1995, 96, you guys were 22 and 10 and 10 and four and got second in the conference. And then 1996, 97, you guys were 26 and nine, nine and five. And it, at that time went from the Metro to Conference USA, which correct me if I'm wrong, it was that you were still Conference USA. A lot of the teams from the Metro went to Conference USA. Is that correct? Yeah, I think half. Okay. All right. So it was a split. Half went somewhere and half went somewhere else. So lots of wins at the Ville. Um, Very successful career. Scored over a thousand points. But at what point did you know you had the potential to be a pro? Um, Probably uh, my junior year. Okay. So you're going through, you're, you're going through your, 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 freshman year and your sophomore year, and you're frustrated at Coach Crum because you're not used to being coached hard and used to so much structure. and But you're playing, though, so that makes it easier to deal with because you're playing. Playing solves a lot of things. And so you're playing, but you're just not quite happy, and then all of a sudden, boom, it hits you, and you wake up, and you realize after two years of being a little bit unhappy that I can be a pro. How did your mind state change? Your mindset change at that time 
from where you were at the two years before. All right. So, uh, it just like life, life happened. Um, going into my junior year, my dad passed away. So that's when everything, everything really clicked. That's, you know, I have nothing else to focus on, but like, um, I just want to dedicate my junior year to my father. So I just went and played like an animal and, uh, it just carried out that way. So, I mean, it motivation just stepped it up when, when that happened, I just, just got super motivated after that. One thing people who know you, I played a lot of basketball with you. Um, once you came back from being overseas and stuff, and uh, we played in some leagues and tournaments and stuff. I, one thing I know is that tattoo, Pops was a Rolling Stone. Is that what it says? It just says Pops. You Pop. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I got it for him. So, yeah. And it, uh, it's just a reminder every time. Every time he's going on the court. It was, I didn't get it till after college, but every time I, I went on the court, you know, I tapped it, talked to talked to my dad, and then I played. So, so uh, let me ask you: during your time in college, did you and and, and your teammates um, were you able to enjoy some tournament success? And if so, um, were there other like as you won, like as you had those three really good seasons? The one season wasn't so good. I think you guys were nineteen and fifteen or something. Maybe you're. Junior or uh, probably sophomore, year. sophomore year, yeah. Your sophomore year, 94 to 95, you guys were like 19 and 15. But as you started to win, as you got older, um, and as you began to have a little bit of tournament success, were there more shoe companies? Were they still trying to like infiltrate Denny Chrome and Converse, or was it just like they knew just to back off because because Coach Crumb wasn't gonna rock that way? Yeah, um, my junior year, Nike Nike came in. They wanted it down. Coach Crum, I guess they offered him a crew. They was going to, you know, the whole school was going to be Nike. And he was like, no, I'm loyal to Converse. And that's that's the way it was. And then I guess after that, you know, we were just stripping Converse. I guarantee you, people came left and right. You know, right. We, like I said, our schedule, we always had like one of the top five schedules in the nation every year. And we was all we was on TV probably 20, 25 times uh, a year. Yeah, you guys were on TV National all the time. TV. Yeah, yeah, so that was perfect for any 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 corporation, shoe corporation, con- trying to get uh, notif- you know notoriety through us. And just for done it easily, just for people who don't know, when he says they had twenty to twenty five games on TV. It's not like it is now where you just tune into ESPN3 or ESPNU and you see, like, back then, basketball games were on 5, 9, or 12 on Saturday and Sunday, um, and they were on ESPN through the week, and Monday was Big Monday, which was Big East, um, Tuesday was a conference, Wednesday was a conference, Thursday was a conference, Friday was a conference, and so there was only... <clears throat> So as I say that, there's only two, four, six, eight, ten. There's only twelve to fourteen TV games a week, like back then, because there's only three to four stations that that played basketball games, and so only three or four networks that played basketball games. So at that time, you're in, in which this is the perfect situation because it leads me to my next question. But at that time, there's Louisville, there's Duke, there's North Carolina. There's the Big East, because the Big East as a whole at that time got a lot of TV games. The Big East, the ACC, and then outside of the Big East and the ACC, it was the best teams in the country. So it was those two conferences and the best teams in the country is who got TV play. Which brings me to my next question. During your time at Louisville, who had the best endorsement deal in college basketball? Um, I want to say... Duke probably, Duke, and then at at, uh, at one point in time, Cincinnati did. They had the Jordan. They brand. had Jordan brand, yeah. Mm-hmm. When they were, uh, I guess it was, it was uh, I want to 
was a, probably my sophomore year, sophomore year, junior year. That's when they had, you know, they, they blew up with Jordan brand. But, um, yeah, I think those two schools pretty much. And uh, Syracuse was, was probably, you know, top five. Yeah. Mm. yeah. If you look. North, and, of course, North Carolina. I forgot that. Yeah, North Carolina. If you look behind me, you'll see um, my Claremont jersey. And during my time at Claremont, and if, for people who don't know, Claremont is um, a branch of UC main campus, University of Cincinnati main campus. And so at the time that I initially went there, it was just a two-year school. Like you could play there for two years and you had to go on. And so when I was there, we got all extra – Jordan gear, right? So all they would send like just bundles and bundles and bundles of Jordan gear to UC. And then anything that they didn't use, they would send to us. And so there would always be enough of it for us to have like the warm-ups and the travel suits. But that's when I realized initially how big everybody on the roster was because – that stuff was so huge, man. Like, I'm 6'2", 175 pounds, and not, everything was so big. Like, it hung off of us, you know? And, like, the thing with those dudes down at UC is they were big and strong, too. So the dudes that were 6'2", were, like, filling out them extra them, them extra larges, you know? and yeah. But we rocked it, Al, and we rocked it proudly, bro. And it, and it, and it just had, like, the uh, – it just had, like – the 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 Jordan logo on it, and then it would just say Cincinnati or something. And so we were UC Claremont of Cincinnati. So we would we would rock it like we'd go on the road, we'd be on road trips, and we'd have it on. And like it was always so big. And looking back on it, um, it's a good thing that people was wearing big clothes back then because it made it look like we were in style or whatever. Um, when you were when you were fortunate enough to play in Phoenix who in the league had the best endorsement deal outside of Jordan because I think that was the was what was that the 98 99 season or 99 2000 season 98 99 I think this uh Jason Kidd had a nice nice deal with Nike he had his own shoe uh Everybody else, like, kind of fell off. Because mm-hmm. I don't remember, like, uh, anybody having a big lucrative shoe deal at that, like, during the time that I was in college. And that's that was my freshman year of college. And I don't really remember anybody having, like, a big lucrative shoe deal at that time. Nobody, really. Uh, Chris Webber lost his deal. Uh, it's like a lot of people lost their deals. So I don't, I don't know. Something I've... I've- Something I've always been curious about and I've never been able to I've never been able to find out. And, you know, I was going to talk to Darius about it once before and it just slipped my mind. But something that I wanted to ask you because of the of the the length that you were there, you were over in Europe and overseas for over uh, over 15 years and played in over a thousand games and was an all-star over there and, you know, played for some championships at certain points in times. And how do sponsorship deals work in Europe? How, how does that work over there? Uh, my first two years, I had, I actually had Nike. I, I had a Nike deal. Um, they, they, they give you a certain amount of money. Um, and then they give you like a credit. So you can go on any, any Nike store, and grab whatever you wanted <laughs> for you, your family, whatever. I mean, they, it's been, a, it was a lot of time where they were just, you know, pissed off because it, it was like, <laughs> here he comes. So, uh, you were sending shoes home to Clint, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it was pretty, pretty nice. And then after that, they just stopped doing it. Uh, you had to be uh, the, the most elite. Euro Euro League team out there like Barcelona still still sponsored by Nike. They probably the, the biggest uh, organization sponsored by Nike, in, I would say, in the world right now. Barcelona, soccer and football and uh, basketball. 
Um, and one blew up for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and one actually took over a lot of European teams. I mean, we I wore and one probably on two teams, uh, and it was mandatory. I didn't like and one, but it was mandatory. I mean, they they gave us shoes, you know, for days. Outfits for days, and we, we had to wear them because they were one of our sponsors. So, so Steph made his impact in Europe. Um, Stephon Marbury, yeah, was that the was that he was the N one, right? Yeah, no, but, no, 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 no. He was the Starberry the World Tour. And one when they went on the World yeah, Tour, yeah, 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 yeah. Really Stephon Marbury. Marbury had his own shoe. He had his own shoe. That was yeah. stolen, uh, Stephen Barry's. Yeah, that was yeah. uh, that was Stone the one mixtape tour. Yeah, yeah. So that's how they blew up. So and one became popular because of the world tour, uh, all the uh, attraction they got off the TV and the summer games, ESPN and stuff like that. Mm. How much more popular are soccer players? than basketball players, you know, in Spain and, uh, you know, in Europe and different, in different places that you've been. Man, it's, it's hands down. It's, it's like the, the major, uh, FIFA guy or, um, you wait for a guy is, is just as popular as Michael Jordan. Hands down. So like, um, Ronaldo, Ronaldo. Yeah. We talked guy, about him yeah. yesterday. We talked about his contract yesterday. Cristiano Ronaldo's got a bigger contract than like LeBron and you know Michael Jordan's the only person who has who doesn't have a bigger. The, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo signed a, a, a one billion dollar lifetime deal with Nike. Yeah. Because because of based solely on based solely on his popularity in 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 that part of the world. Um. Who was the most famous famous athlete from all the different countries that you've been to, with the exception of the United States? So, like all the places that you've been, who was the most um, the most famous athlete, or probably the best athlete? And 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 this is all sports, not just basketball. Uh, remember uh, Ronaldo from Brazil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At that time, uh, he was he was the most famous. At that time, he was I think he was at Milan when I was when I was in Europe. He well, he uh, he actually played yeah Milan. He was in, he was in an Italian uh, football league. So yeah, yeah he, sh he showed out in the Olympics. I remember they had all those commercials and stuff prior to the Olympics, and I was like, man, I hope this dude can live up to the hype. And he was he showed out. He was the truth. Yeah, and then you know, yeah, those all those injuries, and still, you know, he still came up on top. Uh, I, I want to put something out there since we we talking about uh, people overseas. It's this guy, Dijon uh, Body Roker. He was on the Yugoslavia national team, and they actually won. They won the Olympics. He was the point guard. Um, everybody, everybody talks about uh, the Sham God move. You mm -hmm. know? So. When I, he played in Greece, we played in Greece against each other. This was 98. He was the first person I seen do that move before Sam. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he hit the Sam guy before Sam guy. Before Sam. Them, nobody just saw it because it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't here. Yeah. So yeah. Th there's probably a lot more of that too. You know, like I'm convinced that. You know, I'm I'm still tripping off the fact that the free throw line dunk basically made Michael Jordan a billionaire, and Dr. J did it before him. He just didn't brand it and market it like 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 Mike did. You know what I mean? Like that's the difference. So it got it got Dr. J that Converse uh, deal though. Well, but it wasn't. Like that Converse deal wasn't. I guess the. I guess the time. I guess the time. The money wasn't wasn't available like it was when as Mike continued to because Mike has taken that that symbol and branded it to a point of no return. I mean, he's got money for seven, eight, ten, twelve, fifteen generations of his family now over over that dunk. 
who was the biggest influence for you coming up in the late eighties and early nineties um, as an athlete and it could be basketball player or otherwise, who was your biggest influence? And I know you've never been a guy that has always looked up to other people because you've always been a guy that's been looked up to, but how, who, who was probably your idol or someone that you could look back and say, you know, I picked up on a lot from them. Uh, as far as life in general, it would be, it would be my great grandfather, uh, William B. Reed. Uh, they called him Chief. The nickname was Chief in Paris. Uh, you might have went to the park out in uh, in Paris. It's, it's named after him, Chief Reed Park. Gotcha. Uh, and he was, you know, all around athlete. All American in college, football, basketball, baseball, track. Um, he also was a, a coach at Paris Western. They won the national title. Uh, it was the all black high school national title. They, they won that. Then he was uh, the principal. He was a superintendent at Paris. I mean, he had all kind of accolades. And, and then he took me under his wing. Taught me, uh, he didn't teach me sports, but he taught me, uh, taught you life, you know, taught me life, yeah. taught you life. And, and, and for all the kids that are out there listening, understand that the lessons that Mr. Reed taught out in life fought way further exceed anything he ever done in a basketball uniform because those life lessons are what allowed you to pursue your basketball career but then they allow you to have a life after your basketball career. And so if you're young and you're out there listening and you think that basketball or baseball or soccer or golf or whatever the situation is, is going to be what makes you or who defines you. It's not because people forget that part, but they never forget who you are. Um, So I got to ask, man, I want you to put me up on the speed and I got to do this. I have to do it. Um, before we close, tell me about your rivalry in the 10th region with Mason County. And do you feel, so it's a two part question. The, the first question is, you know, please enlighten me on that rivalry because all I've ever heard is the Mason County side of it. I've heard Julius's side. I've heard Sean's side. I've heard Timmy's side. I've heard Crack's side. I've heard Snapper's side. I need to hear your side. And then did those rivalries help you level up as a basketball player? Like knowing that you had to go in the field house 7,500 strong and perform. Did that help with, with your nerves when you went to freedom hall and play in front of 1,800,000 strong and cause you had done it before. So first part, tell me about the rivalry. All right. It- it started with Maysville. I want to put that out there. Maysville Bulldogs. <laughs> but, um, nah, I mean, you know, when I first saw, when I, I first saw Maysville come to Bourbon County for the districts, that's when it, it opened my eyes. I'm like, these guys, you know, they scrappy. They can play. And I, that's when I saw Orlando. And I was like, man, this guy, he, he's, I think he was only eighth grade at the time playing for us. I'm, I'm like, this dude can, can actually play. And um, he was the guy I was, you know, was ready to compete against. The rest of the guys, I didn't think they were a fact. Right. But um, after after they uh, merged to Mason County, no, there was no jitters, none of that, because we played we played them before right? when they were Maysville, mm-hmm. and we they we beat them. They beat us, you know. They beat us to go to the All A Classic, and we beat them to go to the All A Classic. Um, then when it got to Mason County, man, it was just like, they would, we play once a year. Um, I would just, they couldn't stop me. I destroyed them all, but we just, I was just, I mean, I love it. I averaged 30 on them, man. 30, 30 on them. Easy. I think the last, the last, uh, game I played against them, I had like 36, uh, Corey Dunford had like 32. Cold. Man, we, we had the game won. We were up seven with like a minute left. And, um, you know, a couple guys on our team, they, they were rattled and they tricked, we tricked the game off pretty much. So, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't like they dominated us or nothing like that. Or, 
you know, they put fear in our hearts. None of that. I mean, I give I give them credit, man. They they were a good solid team. They they play hard. Julius under underrated for that team. That dude can shoot. Uh, Timmy Timmy's un, you know he was underrated. He, he has a lot you know he, a lot of records, man. I mean, I think he was like eight threes in the game when he was at at Maysville, not right. Mason County, Maysville. Right. As, as a freshman. Mm-hmm. Um, but they always perform. Sean, I don't, I don't, I don't remember much about Sean. Yeah, Sean, he was younger. Was Sean's a couple years, years behind you. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. He don't have much to say, you know, about me. Uh, Lamont Johnson. That was that was the uh, point guard. No, no, no. The goon to come off the bench to try oh. to rattle. <laughs> <laughs> I just, every time he came on in the court, I just laughed at him. So, oh hey, man, why are you out here? Oh, man, that's awesome, man. Like, I know how much, like, the thing is, like, we, every episode that I have somebody on here that's basketball people, that are basketball people, like, the dirt ball always comes up, man. And, like, the dirt ball is, like, the who's who of basketball in, in, in the area, you know, in our area. You know what I'm saying? And if you, if you, if you could, if you can play now, if you could ever play, like, and when you go there for the weekend and you hear, the, the old heads talking to the young heads and the young heads saying what they would have like. I heard somebody trying to tell me like a couple of years ago, like you, you were playing and one of the young guys was like uh, a group of young guys that are really good players. Now college kids, you know, a couple of kids that are pros was like, man, I would have dogged out back. I'm like, bro, listen, you don't know what you ain't never seen. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yeah. Stop it. You don't know what you've never seen. Second part of that question do you feel like the competition against Mays, growing up, being able to play against really good players, not just in Maysville, but Maysville, Lexington, you know, did that help propel you to the next level to understand that, like, it's easy to be the best when you don't have to be better than people that are the best, but you had to be better than people that were really good. Like, you know, a lot of people say for me, for instance, at Ripley, that maybe, I had the junior and senior year that I had because the competition wasn't as strong. That's that's like the that's the only knock that really is on my career. So when I went to college, I had to prove like I'll do this against better players, and I spent my whole lifetime to, trying to prove that because they closed Maysville down. And, and I want to put this out there: if Maysville would have stayed open, I would have been a Maysville Bulldog. I did not want to go out to school out on the hill. I just didn't want to go to Mason County, but. Like, that's the thing. Like, do you think it helped propel you to be a dog, having to play such good competition? Oh, yeah. Um, not only we played in the Dirt Bowl in Maysville, we played in the Dirt Bowl in uh, Lexington. Douglas Park. Douglas Park. It was, uh, at one point in time, it was the top ten in the nation as far as being rated as a summer league. Um, man, it was so many people out there, so many uh, – Prince Stewart, you had Prince Stewart out there, uh, played with Tim Hardaway at UTEP. You had uh, Sean Woods, uh, Eddie Davender, all the all the UK, the former UK guys played out there. And then you had Darnell Burt, uh, George Gentry, all those guys, you know, from the surrounding uh, schools that played. Uh, I mean, they were legendary. Charlotte Court was legendary. Uh, uh, who? Who just team? Uh, I think it was the Pistons. Man, they, I mean, yeah, Lexington they, Pistons. We were. Yeah. I was talking to George about that. That 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 the team had. We played them one year in the Dirt Bowl, and we were we competed for as long as we could. I I didn't have like that team of guys that I had over the last. When I stopped playing as much and started coaching, I went where I went wrong for so many years in Dirt Bowls was I tried to put teams together. And I didn't put teams together that were full of guys that were better than me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> when you put those dirt bowl teams together, you got to put teams together. Like if you're the guy putting the team together, you got to put a team together with guys that are better than you. And this year in particular, we played the Lexington Pistons and they had DP, Daniel Price. They had Barry Bowman. They had Jerron Brown. They had George Baker all on one team. Plus, plus they had a couple other cats. And um, for all them ball hogs, they played well together. Um, last thing, Al, I'm gonna give you a chance to uh, to plug your um, your S5 Academy 
and whatever it else that you're doing out here for a side hustle because the thing about us is we have a lot of side hustles but all of them involve um helping kids and increasing kids potentials and 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 opportunity to to elevate their game and their skill set and their academic achievement so go ahead and um if there's anything out there i can do to help you as far as promoting yourself and your brand and your product now's the time al go ahead well like i said i have uh the s5 academy facebook page so all the information is on there if if, if uh if you want to schedule something with me, I can come into town, run a clinic, uh, run a camp, anything anything you need uh, for your particular basketball player or team. Uh, I do individual. I do teams. I do uh, small sessions. Uh, I teach them all the, all the fundamentals. I, I look, I evaluate each player and try to enhance their uh, fundamentals pretty much. So, again, S5 Academy's Facebook page is not hard to look up. S5 Academy. And just go on there, like my page, check out my content. I have videos uh, from all the work I've done. I have uh, uh, philosophy about uh, how to make it to the next level and everything else. Okay. And before we get off here, give us a rundown of the kids. Asia, uh, Middle Tennessee State, right? Nah, Asia, she graduated from Tennessee State uh, last year. Okay, so she's done. She had a great career there. Yeah. And then uh, my son, Iggy, Isaiah. Isaiah, yeah. He's at Midway University. Uh, okay. He, got, he has one more year. Is that in Chicago? Nah, it's in Kentucky, Midway. Oh, M- Midway. Yeah, Midway. I, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'm thinking of uh, Brown Mackey is in Kansas. Um, uh, and then you have another daughter that's playing there in yeah, Davenport yeah. now. Yeah, Isabella. Um, she's a junior. Uh, she's a dog, man. I, if I I try to get her to move down there, she if she was down there, it'd be a, a definite spectacle to watch. <laughs> and then um, Avery. Avery, I want to give a shout out to Avery. Today's her birthday. So fifteenth uh, birthday. Uh, <laughs> she she's a freshman at Mason County. Yeah, uh, a lot of, lot of uh, upside to her game. She yeah. just got to got to find herself. So. She'll be all right. So Asia's graduated. Iggy's at Midway. Isabella is at Davenport, Eaton, and Avery is at Mason County. So anybody else you want to shout out before we get off here, Al? Uh, just shout out all the, all the Paris, Kentucky people, man, that, that that's supported me all through my career. Uh, also, Mason County, they, uh, they had a big uh, footprint in my life, too. Um, uh, the Myricks, uh, they, you know, they took me in. And I, I had I had to say I almost went to uh, Mason County because uh, Orlando at one point in time. <laughs> they were like they were like brothers to me, so I just want to give a shout out to them too. Well, hopefully I see you this August uh, at the Dirt Bowl if everything is uh, this Corona stuff is cleared up and we're back to normal. Al, I appreciate you joining me tonight. I had a great great time talking to you, and uh, you take care, man. You need anything, you let me know. All right, man. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Alvin Sims uh, from Paris, Kentucky, now living in Davenport, Iowa. Um, Paris High School, 10th Region Hall of Famer, um, State of Kentucky Hall of Famer, a Louisville Cardinal legend, and former Phoenix Suns uh, player, and had an illustrious had an illustrious career overseas. Um, I appreciate everybody joining me tonight. It's been uh, another good podcast, man. And so uh, we're just going to route the Piccolo Pete. You made me sick. Signing out.
What's up, brother? I'm done. Can you uh, stop that or whatever it is? For some reason, my computer is not. Okay. 